I just took a DNA test, and it turns out there's only 1% chance that I'm leaving Juan Dixon. Hey everybody, welcome to my channel. I am Rafael and I'm here to review season eight, episode nine of The Real Housewives Whose Husband Still Thinks That We're Gonna Believe Him of Potomac. We start the episode off with Karen and Ray heading to their backyard to their gazebo. Karen is telling Ray, Well, Ray, the other day when I called you on the phone to tell you something important, I didn't appreciate that you kind of just brushed me off the phone like I was some basic woman. I am the grand dame. I am Karen Huger. You need to respect me and my time. I would never hang up on you like that. Why would you do that to me, Ray? So Ray was just like, oh, I'm so sorry. I would never just brush you off the phone like that. If it did look like that, I'm so sorry. I apologize. You know I care about you. Okay, that's good, right? She also says that she's having a luncheon with the group for her program, Pave, that she's a part of. Then we see Ashley, Giselle, and Sleepy Sharice. <laughs> Leave us alone already, Sharice. Why are you back on the show? But, you know, Sharice, she woke up from retirement because Ashley and Giselle, they need to fill her in on everything that happened in Texas for some reason, which is not much. But you already know that Sharice was sitting there like... Okay. Yeah, Candace, Candace, Candace got into it with you. Okay. Uh -huh. oh, oh, Wendy wasn't speaking to you too, Giselle. Oh, okay. Uh -huh. Who's Aneka? <laughs> Oh, Sharice, but Sharice, she was back for like a second. Then we see Mia and her husband, Gordon, right? They're going to this place to make some pasta, but they're having a double date with a mystery couple, right? As they're setting everything up, we see Robin pull up, but she's with her unfaithful husband, Juan Dixon. He shows up and I'm like, oh, say it ain't so. Is it really him? It's really Juan Dixon. That hold on, hold on. I have to bring out my chart. You already know how this goes. Hold on. Need to update it. Can't believe this. So as of now, Juan has been in episodes one, two, three, four. He was not in episode five, nor episode six. He was in episode seven. He was in episode eight. And he's in this current episode, episode nine. So Juan kudos to you. I am so proud of Juan and I have a feeling I'm gonna see him in the intro for next season. Like he's gonna be wearing a pink tuxedo right next to Karen, right next to Giselle, right in the middle holding his champagne flute. I can see it already but you know I'm impressed like Juan he's really working for his Bravo check. The only check he has coming in but he shows up with Robin but before they even go in he makes a very suspicious phone call and is it just me or I could have swore when he called when he picked up the phone he said, hey, baby. Like, is it just me? Did I just, am I the only one who heard that? He said, hey, baby. But he was calling some coach because he's desperate for a job. And he starts talking to them like, hello, baby. Um, yeah, no, like, no, no, for sure. Like, we could definitely meet up tonight. You could come over tonight. Yeah, I'm going to leave the back door open. And Robin, can you walk away for a second? You know, Robin, she's going to be out, you know, filming for the Real Housewives. You know, yeah, she's going to be filming with that with Giselle. And yeah, you could come over. What, what kind of panties are you wearing? What? Stop it. What? Oh, oh yeah, yeah, I really need that job, coach. <laughs> like, Juan, you're not fooling anybody, but, you know, whatever. He was looking for a job, so that's that. Him and uh, Robin, they go inside to meet up with Mia and Gordon. They get the activity on the go. You know, they're making pasta. They're making, you know, scrambled eggs or whatever. And Mia and Gordon, they're being romantic about it, right? You know, they're you know, combining hands, interlocking fingers within the eggs and stuff. Meanwhile, we see Robin and Juan. Okay, can you please not touch my fingers? Thank you. Okay, can you move over? Okay, give me some, give, give me some eggs. Mm-hmm, yeah. Okay, so what's next? <laughs> like, no connection, no romance, no nothing. Just eggs and pasta, and that's it, right? So after that, then Mia, she starts up the interrogation, right? She tells Robin... Um, so like Robin, like, did you tell your husband Juan about anything that happened in Texas? And then we see in a freaking flashback that Mia actually talked to Robin one on one in Texas about this whole situation. And she told Robin to her face, I feel like this whole story that, you know, your husband is telling you is a bunch of BS. I don't believe it. Now, why did we cut that out from the, oh, the whole entire trip? 
Why do we have to see them going to some, you know, some chicken shit bingo thing or whatever and not see this proper scene? Like, this is what we want to see. Like, the producers are just, mm, mm, mm. But, you know, Robin, Robin made sure to not even bother looking up at the camera. She was looking down the whole time because she knew the BS was coming. She was like, you know, she's making her pasta. Um, no, I didn't, I didn't tell him anything. <laughs> I'm like, what's wrong now, Robin? Say it with your chest. You know, lift your head up. And then Mia goes on to Juan. And she's like, oh, well, like, I mean, Juan, me, me and you, I mean, me and Robin, we discussed everything that happened between you and that girl that you, you, you met up with or whatever at the hotel. Mia, she knew exactly what she was doing. She was playing dumb. She knew how this whole story went. She wanted Juan to stumble on his lies, right? She's like, so, I mean, you paid for her hotel, right? Like, through the phone? <laughs> Mia, you know damn well that he went to the hotel in person and he paid himself through the phone. Could you even do that? But, you know, Juan, you could just tell Juan. He has steam going out his ears. He's looking at her like... I mean, yeah, I could have done that, but I was already in the neighborhood. I decided to just drive there. I needed the fresh air anyway. So I got there. I put my credit card. I, that was it, though. I just paid for it, and that was it. We did not sleep together. I did not sleep with her. I left as soon as I paid for it. I just wanted to be a good person. Mm-hmm. Yep. Yep. It, it was sunny outside, too. Yep. But that's exactly what happened. And I was definitely missing Robin. I miss her a lot. Mm hmm What is Robin doing? She's working on her pasta. <laughs> Looking down the whole entire time. You know, she's sweating too. Like, please don't forget the way our story went. Please don't forget how our story went. And the more him and Robin say the story out loud, the more foolish it sounds. Like, you really want us to believe that? Like, you really went to the hotel. You paid for this random person's hotel. And then you left? Like, what was the intention behind that, Juan? But, okay, so then Mia was just like, oh, I mean, like, really? I mean, that's so strange. But, I mean, at least now you know for next time. <laughs> You know, and then she she threw the bait out there, but luckily Juan, again, he's working for his Bravo check. He caught what she was trying to say, and she was he was just like, um, no, there won't there won't be a next time. I already learned from my mistakes, from my mistakes, my mistakes, because it wasn't a one time thing. I already learned from my mistakes, so it's not gonna happen next time. Thank you. And Mia's just looking at him in disgust, like. As he's talking and, you know, Gordon, he was sitting there, you know, sitting in the back like, okay, if he even raises his voice like the way he does Robin, I'm jumping in. Now it's going to be a two-on-two -two fight. And that was that. But they started talking about the lawyer situation. You know that. He, trigger warning, he committed suicide um, over, you know, how he was stealing from Mia and Gordon. They confronted him. So then he did that. But he left the child and wife behind. And Mia, she still feels guilty over that. She wonders if that whole situation could have been handled differently. And honestly, I wonder that too. Because, I mean, if he's stealing from you, you're going to confront him, obviously, and tell him, hey, this is wrong, right? Like, what else do you expect? You just don't expect that outcome to be so severe, right? So... I don't know. It's just all a very sad situation in general. But then Robin, she explains to us that she's going into a new business venture, something to do with facials. But wait, is she still selling those raggedy embezzled hats or is that not a thing anymore? So she's selling embezzled hats. She has her Bravo check, at least for now she does. And now she's doing this facial thing. So that means she has three jobs versus Juan's how many? Zero. Yet he has the nerve to be doing this, this, and this behind her back when she's pulling in all the money at home. But you know what? I already accepted it for Robin. If this is what she accepts from her marriage from Juan, then it is what it is. We can't do anything about it anymore until she opens up her eyes eventually, maybe one day, right? And this whole scene, this whole interaction between Juan, Robin, and Mia, this, this certified exactly what I said last week, that Mia is still my favorite on the show. Mia, to me, is the new Grand Dama Potomac. Sorry, Karen. Like, the fact that she takes it there, she questions anybody on the show with no issue. Like, yeah, I want to know what happened with you, this girl, this hotel situation. She gets down to the details, and she has no issue saying it to your face. And if you throw it back at her, and you want to question her or, you know, throw a low blow at her, she has no issue with that either. She's like, okay, yeah, I used to be this. I used to be that. What about it? She's shameless, and I like that. And speaking of staying on script, we head over to Wendy's house, and she sits down with her mom to ask her, so how was it when you were in the hospital sick? Her mom is looking at her like, since who was sick? <laughs> and already I'm listening to this like, bullshit alert, bullshit alert, bullshit alert. Wendy, she tried to help her recover. Like, yeah, when you were in the hospital, wink, wink. Remember you were in the hospital sick? Remember mom? The mom was like, 
Oh, oh yeah, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. I was in the hospital. Yeah, I remember I was in the hospital. Like, yeah, I remember. I remember I had elective surgery. <laughs> Honestly, we should have known the direction that this whole conversation was going based off her wine glass. It had a straw in it. That's all we needed to know where this was going to go. But the mom, she's like, oh, yeah, I had elective surgery, but, you know, I had some complications, but nothing serious. I was fine. I was OK. I wasn't sick. But how did you say that? But then Wendy told us something completely different last week about her appendix or something serious. And now now it was nothing like now it was elective surgery. So how did Wendy not know that? Mm -hmm. She tells her that she's been having issues with the new girl, Aneka, who knows Lebe, who's a close friend of Wendy's family. She also mentioned that you threw her name in a shrine. Do you know anything about this? First of all, it's very hard to believe that this is the first time that Wendy and her mom are discussing Aneka or this whole situation in general. Like, you really want me to believe that? And then on top of that, the mom was like, first of all, who is Aneka? Like, you mean to tell me that Aneka really came onto the show and just made up this crazy scenario about you calling her, threatening her to put her name in a shrine? For what reason? What would be the purpose? For a storyline? Like, that's why I feel like there's some lies going on between Wendy and her mom. Because how do you not know her when she knows all everything about you? Or at least she's, she mentioned all of this about you. Like, you must have had some type of conversation or interaction with her. And then on top of that, she says, oh, well, Laban... You know, she's so close to our family. People always assume that she's like my daughter. So then it brings me back to what Wendy told uh, NECA a couple of episodes ago. I don't know who she is, but yet, according to the mom, she's so close to the family that people assume that she's her daughter. So it's just like, what is going on? And I don't know. The whole story just sounds like a mess. It sounds like lies. I still don't believe Wendy or NECA, but now... I don't know, I'm leaning more towards Aneka in to some capacity because how do you not know who she is at all? And then she says, oh, well, I don't know anything about a shrine either. I'm gonna pray for her. I don't know, I just don't think that, I mean, it's possible that Aneka could lie to that extreme, but for what? Like, what is she getting out of it? Then we see Giselle taking her daughter Grace to a self-defense class because she's gonna be going away to college soon. She's gonna be by herself and Giselle wants her to be safe and alert at all times, which I thought it was an amazing thing of Giselle to do for her daughter. So they get to the gym. They have a trainer who's teaching them all the self-defense moves. Grace, she gets up to practice with him. She does well. She even flips the trainer on his back. Then we get to her mom. Giselle, you know, she tries to flip the trainer on his back. She manages to flip herself on her back. Then he fell on top of her. So now they're both rolling around on the ground like fish. And Grace is looking at her like... <laughs> So eventually, Grace and Giselle, they sit down to stretch and talk. Giselle wants to talk about dating, but Grace, she's not concerned on dating in college. Right now, she's focused on herself and college, and that's that, right? And for some reason, Giselle brings up Jason, the guy that she's paying, I mean, the guy that she's dating, and she's like, well, once all my daughters leave my house, I'm going to have nothing but time, and he lives in New York. I live here, so we're going to have time to see each other. Okay, Giselle, if that's the story you want to tell yourself, then I believe it with you. So then she calls Jason when he should be calling me. And she's like, hey, Jason, how are you? Look, Grace is Jason. And she's like, hey, Jace. Even she knows it's a bunch of BS, right? <laughs> so then that was that. They had a cute little chit chat between both of them. And then that was that. Grace and Giselle, they start exercising. But then Grace, she accidentally pulls a Cynthia Bailey and she kicks Giselle right in the vagina. We well, all remember that fight on the boat between Cynthia and Portia when she kicked Portia right in the vagina and Portia went flying. <laughs> I still can't believe that happened. But, you know, this whole scene between Grace and uh, Giselle, it was nice. It was really, really cute. We see Candace heading over to meet up with Aneka at a restaurant. And on her way there, she's on the phone with her mom, Dorothy, letting her know that she just got her mammogram done. And she's nervous because the doctors found two lumps on her breast. And they told her, we'll keep an eye on it. We'll see what happens. But Candace tells us that there's a history of breast cancer in her family and she doesn't want to just wait around and see what happens or for the two lumps to possibly become cancerous if something could be done about it now, which is understandable, right? Because, I mean, what do you even do in her position? That is nerve-wracking, right? She sits down with Aneka to discuss Wendy and Aneka starts off by saying, Wendy started with me first by calling me an L.A. crackhead. Clearly, Aneka's timeline is completely off because you're the one that started with the name calling first, but I guess we forget. But Candace called her out on it and she's like, uh, but you called her a bitch first. And just because you don't like somebody or somebody rubs you the wrong way doesn't mean that you could call them a bitch. And I'm like, I know, I know, I know that is not Candace, drive back Dillard, but set saying that. I know that is not her. 
<laughs> like, Candace, please, you're the last person that, that should be telling anybody that. The wind could blow the wrong way and you'll call somebody a bitch. So please stop. She goes on to say that it was never her intention on confronting Wendy in a crowd of people, even though that's what it looks like, because you talked about the issue that you had with Wendy and her family, where everybody except Wendy one-on-one, -on -one, that's all you had to do is just call Wendy like, hey, can we sit down, discuss this, and possibly move on, get along, and start fresh? But no, on top of that, you called her a bitch, unprovoked, for no reason. So... You know, it's such a shame, too, because her and Candace, they started talking about their IVF journey, how they could relate to that. And, you know, she was, Aneka was cool the first episode. And then after that, everything that just went downhill because, you know, we kind of just went from her life and her marriage and her, you know, her new house that she just got and her IVF journey to Shrine Wendy's mom. Shrine Wendy's mom. Like... You know, we really didn't get to know Aneka as a person. We still don't know her. She's sitting here with Candace and this whole conversation is just very awkward because Aneka is just so out of place because we don't really know who she is. Like, all we know is Shrine, Wendy's mom. Shrine, Wendy's mom. But, you know, such a disappointment. But, you know, they continue talking about that and eventually Candace, she feels a little uh, somewhat uncomfortable because she feels that she's trying to stay loyal to Wendy but also, she's trying to be cool with Aneka. Aneka doesn't get along with Wendy. But, Candace, nobody ever told you that you couldn't be friends with Aneka. Because, I mean, look at Wendy. She's being friends. She's trying to be friends with Ashley, one of your biggest enemies on the show. And she doesn't really have that issue with you. Like, so she's not telling you, oh, you can't be friends with Aneka. She clearly just told you, hey, be careful with the way you talk about me to Aneka. That's it. She never went up to you in Texas and said, hey, you're not allowed to talk to her. Like... We get to Karen's pave event and one by one, everybody starts coming in, including Wendy's friend, Kiarna, that we haven't seen in a while. She shows up to take a seat with them. Karen, she gets on the podium to do a beautiful speech. After the speech, we have an essay survivor who wants to perform a song on her guitar because she feels that music is the best therapy to get through what she went through, right? So as she's performing, as she's singing, everybody's quiet, everybody's getting emotional. Mia, she's crying out to Karen. Karen is crying one by one in the confessional. Trigger warning, trigger warning, trigger warning. One by one in the confessional, we hear from Robin, Candace, and Ashley and their unfortunate experience with being essayed, starting with Robin. She says that when she was a teenager, she was too young to consent to what happened to her. Candace, she didn't even realize what happened to her at the time was what it was until later on in life. Ashley, she got essayed by a family member and... It's just so disgusting and sad how somebody would take advantage of you that way. Mia, she's getting emotional, so she gets up. She can't handle it anymore. She uh, storms out and she goes into the bathroom, right? She has a whole nervous breakdown in the bathroom. She starts crying. She's trying to keep herself together. I was expecting Robin to go after her, you know, because Mia went after her in Texas. But maybe Robin was caught up in her, you know, her mindset, her emotions as well, you know, because it's a very sensitive topic. So then Ashley, she gets up to go check on Mia. She's like, what's going on? What's happening? So Mia eventually comes out. She hugs her. Mia starts telling her that she almost didn't come to the event because the topic is too close to home because of her friendship with Jacqueline from last season. If we all remember, their friendship goes all the way back. And from what I'm getting from what Mia is telling us is that Jacqueline had a boyfriend at the time who disgustingly, he essayed Mia. And Mia never realized that, you know, she was misplacing her, the, her feelings over the whole situation over on Jacqueline, not because Jacqueline set her up or put her in that situation. It was just misplaced emotions and she was taking it out on Jacqueline. And that's why she has been treating her the way she has all these years in, the, in their friendship, specifically what we saw last season as well. You know, we always wonder like, why is she taking all these jabs at Jacqueline? Why is she being so extra, or extra shady or putting her on the spot in these embarrassing moments? Now we see why, now we see where it stems from. So, you know, it's just, it's just so sad overall because, you know, we have a friendship here that, that, you know, is damaged because of that situation. And, you know, this is where production messed up again, because this is what we want to see. Like, this is real life. This is a real life story. I'm pretty sure that there's so many people out there watching that could probably relate to their situation or are in a friendship similar to Mia and Jacqueline who will want to see something like this play out. Not because of drama or, oh, we need to see what happens or whatever, but because this is real life. Like, this is a real friendship. They had a real history between each other but it's just so so sad she starts crying into ashley's arms and she's like 
everything's gonna be okay, everything's gonna be okay, and you know, Mia gets herself together and they make it back into the big room. Shout out to Karen and the whole cast for bringing awareness to this topic. I know it may not be easy to discuss it sometimes, but unfortunately, this is what happens in people's lives and we need to talk about it more. And if any of you have gone through something like this or know somebody who's going through something like this or has gone through something like this, I am sending you all, all, all my love and we will talk very soon, okay? Bye, everybody. Mwah.